Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, verse 6. I was reading an article this week, and uh, I'm amazed on, I wouldn't say ignorance, but blatant disregard of clear scriptures. This pastor of a mainstream denomination in the States was saying, he said, I know many of you all think this is going to be a prelude to the coming of the Christ. He said, don't get your hopes up. The rapture will never happen. He said, no matter what I see in scripture and all the studies I've done, it is a gross misinterpretation of scripture. And I said, buddy, if you want to hang around this time, you can go right and have it. I'm gone. And, but, you know, it's amazing. But the thing about it, he had over 800 shares in three days. Now, I don't know if it was good shares or bad shares, but he had over 11,000 views on his post. And I thought, what a false prophet. Telling people that there is no hope. And the only one that I know that shares doom and gloom is Satan, not God. And to say that we're getting our hopes up for the rapture, he's got another thing coming because God is going to surprise him one day. And this is something that I want to speak about this morning. And is the after departure reality. For us, the reality is going to set in for many of our friends co-workers, family, that have kind of just looked at us and says, yeah, if church is your thing, you, you go ahead. I've had family members tell me that, you know, and, and I've had friends tell me that if church is your thing, you know, that's, if you need it, you, you go ahead. No, I don't need it. I need it. You know, I just don't need it. It's not something I need. I need it because I can't do it without Christ. And so as we look at this painting that was painted in the 1970s, I absolutely love it. Closed due to the rapture. <laughs> That's going to be our building here on Enfield Road. They can use it. They can have it. They can vandalize it. They can burn it. They can do whatever they want to. After the Lord comes and gets his church, his bride, it won't matter. They can have every lock, stock, and barrel of things I have in the house I rent, my truck, my car, my whatever. Once I see my Lord face to face, all that I have won't matter. As a good friend of mine who used to own a large grading company that operated in three states, had over 700 employees, he used to said, in light of eternity, it's like a pile of coffee grounds and potato pills. You know, all the equipment I own, and I worked for him, massive organization. But it was just, he says, all this one second after the rapture, all this piece of equipment is just going to sit here. He said, I'm gone. And you know, when you think about this, turn on the television and we see hate, envy, anarchy, social justice trying to repair our wrongs. We see animosity toward Christianity, animosity for those that want to stand for right. If you don't agree with the mantra of the world today, you're labeled everything in the book. The time is coming. It's gearing because you think about this. History book, when I studied history, that's exactly what Lenin did. If you didn't agree with the Red Army, then you were done. That was the same thing that Hitler and the Browns did if you didn't agree with them. And so you think about Mosatong, Castro, all of these. If you didn't agree with them, then you were put here. What is happening today? We're not going to prison, but we're sure being land blasted. Businesses are being closed. Bakeries that refuse to uh, bow on their principles are being persecuted. So on and so forth. Photographers, whatever. Because you do not agree with sin, you're labeled as a phobe of some sort. The world is getting ripe for someone to stand in place. But in that light... I want you to watch this video. And the question I'm going to ask today, are you ready? Because the departure is a reality. Because we're going to preach on what happens after the departure. But this video was filmed many years ago down in Queensland, Australia. 
and it has touched my heart every time I watch it, just a short clip. But I want you to watch this video and ask yourself, will you be left or will you go? about a church full of people and a twinkling of an eye. Wouldn't that be an absolute I wonder how many graves out here will break open and how many graves will be left all across this great nation. I believe far more earlier graves will open than later graves because our nation was more godly centuries ago. But those of us that are alive, can you imagine never facing death? We'll be like Elijah and Enoch. We walked with God and was not. And Moses, think about God himself being your undertaker. Buried by God, what a, what a privilege. As I look at the scriptures and I look around on the news around us and I look at the society and men and women's mentality, I can see how easily someone can easily say, I have the answer, and they'll follow. You think about what we've been going through. Everybody, including myself, we need to stay inside. We need to wear masks. We need to do this, and we do it. Can you imagine if someone far more persuasive than Justin and anybody else in the world says, I've got the answer to all of our political problems, all our financial problems, all starvation problems, all of health problems. We and this is where 2 Thessalonians comes in play. Look in verse 6, please. And now you know what withholded that he might be revealed in his time. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Isn't that the truth? Iniquity already is in play. Amen? Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. The Holy Spirit has to be removed. And then shall the wicked one be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Talking about the day of Armageddon. Even when, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them a strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, 
but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Hold your finger there and turn over to Revelation chapter 12, please. Revelation chapter 12. We're talking about when the church is removed, a man steps in the place of the Holy Spirit, steps in the place of God and says, I am him. That's why he's called the Antichrist. But notice, the people that have rejected God, have dismissed God, have loved unrighteousness more than righteousness, they are now given over by God to a strong delusion to believe a lie. In other words, they will not know the truth if it slapped them beside the face. But look what it said in Revelation chapter 12, verse 11 and 8, or 11, 11 and 18. And they overcame him by the blood, blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony. They loved not their lives unto death. Therefore, they rejoiced, ye heavens, and then dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth, and of the seal, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. The devil is going to have a field day. And I want you to see the last part of the divorce. Not only are they going to face the wrath of the devil, but they're going to face the wrath of God, which is far more. The devil does not care about humanity. He knows his time is short. He, devil, uses men and women as pawns. Just like we see on the television. The news media flips quicker than a flip card. I mean, they go from one thing to another to another to another, trying to stir up this. Who do you think is behind that? The devil wants to incite riot. He hates people. Who do you think puts in the heart to murder, to steal, and to kill? It says the father of the devil. But you notice in 2 Thessalonians, it says something really profound, that they would not receive the love of the truth. Isn't that great? We need more evangelists. We need more people that are not afraid to say, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. The love of the truth, it saves. But people are like, I don't want that. If that church is good for you, then that you do what you want to do. But I don't need religion. I'm hearing that more and more as I talk to people. I don't need religion. It has caused so much problems in the world. Isn't that the devil's lie? And this is where you look at reality is the world is being marched to the devil's drum. What will happen when the world is at the point where it begins to usher in the Antichrist, then we need to start looking for the eastern sky. We need to start looking and say, Lord, is it today? And we need to live with every moment of every day witnessing and telling someone about Jesus Christ because you never know who's going to be left behind. And the reality is the departure is sure. No matter what charlatans say, the Bible is true. Until someone lives it and gives their heart to Jesus, they never know how good God is, how faithful he is. And this is what's exciting about knowing that we may be the ones living in the last times. We may be the ones that never will see the hearse. That, wouldn't that be great? We'll never, and we get to see our parents, our children, our loved ones that have passed on. What happens afterwards? Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of knowing Christ as our Savior. If there's one in the sanctuary, one online that does not know Jesus Christ, and if that trumpet were to sound this very moment, and they've never put their personal faith and trust and confess with their mouth of their sin, let this be the morning that the Holy Spirit illuminates in their heart the reality of being left behind to face the atrocities of the devil and the wrath of God. Thank you for loving us and making a way of escape, as the Bible says in Corinthians and Thessalonians, about not facing the wrath of God. Lord, I thank you for your love. Thank you for your word. Use it, I pray, to challenge us and equip us. And as the Bible says, to comfort one another in these last days. In Jesus' precious name, amen. A question I get asked a lot, and 
predominantly more now is unfortunately in the 80s there was a left behind series and one of the falsehoods of the left behind was that people that did not get saved before the rapture could get saved after the rapture but if we read exactly what second Thessalonians says it says that if you have denied the truth before it's not all of a sudden oh they were right that really wouldn't be a true genuineness saved it would just be kind of like oh I, mom and dad were right so now I'm going to get saved so no it doesn't work that way those that do get saved are those in parts of the world that have never heard the Bible will show you here in the word of God on how they will go to every corner do you realize we have missionaries in parts of Belgium and talking to people that have never heard the name of Jesus we have people in Italy predominantly Catholic but they've never heard the real Jesus think about all those what about I've got friends in Indonesia I've got friends in South Africa and other places in places that most people don't go there seven and a half billion or 7.7 .7 billion people and when they say when you look at Wycliffe and others that only a third have the gospel in their language and that, that's almost depressing but you see we have a lot of work to be done but God anoints 144,000 to reach and protects them to where the beast and the false prophet it says fire cannot touch them you can imagine the wrath of the devil as they're going around telling about the kingdom of heaven but they can't be touched people will get saved but unfortunately it's not those that knew it before the rapture as the Bible says here and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they received not the love of the truth that they might be saved and for this cause God shall send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie God's going to send because they refused to accept Christ because oh that was mom and dad's faith or that was grandma and grandpa's faith that was uncle and aunt's faith or that was my neighbor's faith that's not for me you look at the last few years how many movies about zombies and aliens and everything like that and, and how alien abduction how do you think they're going to explain let's say let's round it off to a billion Christians disappear across the world how are they going to explain pilots disappearing out of the planes? How are they going to explain taxi drivers disappearing? How are they going to explain doctors in the middle of surgery going, Doc doctor? <laughs> well, yeah. Or how do you explain babies gone? How do you explain this? There was an alien abduction. Because they're spending billions of dollars to find the uh, extraterrestrial in the world, somewhere out there, and the Bible says there was only one planet. However, they want to prove, who do you think is behind this? Think about all of the weird creatures they're coming up with on the movies. They're desensitizing everybody. I don't know what the devil's going to pull, but when I read Revelation, there is some pretty interesting stuff that is plagues and things like that. Whether it's reality, whether it's figurative, we don't know all of it. But we know that a lot of the Bible speaks in a figurative and we know that some of these creatures and things, we know that the Bible says a third of the world is going to die. It says that it's going to get so costly, famine is going to cost a day's wage for a loaf of bread. I don't know about your grocery bills, but mine's gone up considerably over the last few months. But do you think about this? What will this world accept they want to accept an answer. Who's going to bring them all together for all the disappearance of mankind? Somebody has to bring them together. Somebody has to bring peace. Somebody has to bring, and the Bible says he does have peace for a short time, even peace with Israel. One of the hot topics of every prime minister, every queen, and every king across this world is peace in the Middle East. 
I haven't seen it yet. Some have even got Nobel Peace Prizes for bringing peace to the Middle East. I haven't seen peace. Have you seen peace? But the thing is, they want peace. I was laughing the other day, and it said that the world is memeing the world, um, what do you call it, Miss Universe pageant. They all say, we want and world peace. Yeah, that's a figurative speech, but we know it's not going to happen until God allows the Antichrist to have this time of peace. But it's very short-lived. And then he reneges on Israel. And then basically, as John Phillips said in his book, all hell will break loose on earth. To the point where the Bible says men will cry out for rocks to fall upon themselves. They want to die, but they can't. This is not a time for anybody to think about, oh yeah, it's just going to go through three and a half years. We're going to be all good. This is three and a half years. We're going to be all peaceful. And then three and a half years, oh, we can get through it. Seven years, folks, is a long time. You think about three of the half years is going to be peaceful. But what about the last part? You just have to read from Revelation 5 on to see that it will not be a pleasant place to be living. But the very first thing that's going to happen to the people that are left, they will believe lies. A strong delusion to believe a lie. But also in Revelation 13, Revelation 13 and verse 15, Revelation 13 and verse 15, And he hath power to give life unto the image of the beast, and the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Verse 16, And he caused all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that hath the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man. And his number is six hundred, three score, and six. They're so willing to follow him. I don't know if many of you followed, but um, Bill Gates wants to develop a coronavirus vaccine. But he said the best way to do to know who's been vaccinated is to have a chip in their hand. Hmm, interesting. I better be run by Microsoft too. But he said that's the way, that way we cannot go in and out of stores or in and out of public places without having our hands scanned to say we have the vaccine. Who said that was a great idea? That way everybody can travel through the world and know who's been COVID free or not. Folks, my Bible says that um, only those that deceive and believe a lie will have a mark. There is nothing going in this hand or this forehead or anything else that will tell me who I am. I'm not a part of that crowd. And you know what? A interesting article I read this two weeks ago, and it was a black pastor in Dallas, Texas, and he says, you know, that would be called electronic slavery. In my bad days before God saved me in a federal penitentiary, I had to wear a tracker on me that told the government everywhere I went when I was on parole because of the things I did. He said, even though I was free, I was not. He said, because if I went out of the boundaries of my parole hearing, there was a call on my cell phone and said, you're out of your area. You need to go back into your area. He says, if people don't believe in slavery, what do you think this is? You can't buy bread. You can't shop. You can't do this. And now we can't go anywhere if we don't have a coronavirus and a chip. 
He says, they're trying to desensitize. Oh, for health, we'll do it. Yes, oh yes, please. He said, if we have that easy to give up our freedom, just imagine when the man comes on, that's a suave, smooth, cavalier type of fellow, says, guys, come on now. Let's unify. We're all one. Here, put the number here and put the number here. Is it a barcode? Is it whatever? It could be anything, folks. Boy, back then you would think, I used to think that somebody was having a brand and going, you know, right here or there. But now with all the technology, just imagine what it could be. It could be a chip. It could be a barcode. It could be your cell phone. I mean, if you look at your cell phones, Apple and Androids, if uh, somebody told me about it and I didn't believe it and I looked at it, on my phone now is a COVID tracker. I had to turn it off because it's on there. They're tracking my phone to see if I'm anywhere near other people that have tested positive for COVID. And it would warn me. And that's interesting. I went delete and off because I don't want to be tracked. It's bad enough. But this is where they'll believe lies. Just think of what people believe today. And you're like, are you that gullible? Wow. And this is where the world is gearing up to. Revelation. 13 clearly says he causeth all both small and great rich and poor free and bond or slave to receive a mark they were willing why because God had given them over because they have rejected the sound truth of love and the gospel and now they're willing to say well I gotta have a job I gotta have this so everything you see how people justify things today I'm unbelievable how people justify their actions. Well, you don't understand. Well, I've got to do this and I've got to do that. As they all say, sheeple. We're just a bunch of sheep. And whatever someone says, oh, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. I love it when a friend of mine said, I'm going to preach a message one day on the death of common sense. What is it? You know, think about this. Is salvation important to us it should be because after the rapture comes if we have had the opportunity to be under the sound of the gospel or be witnessed to or have heard the gospel the Bible says after we're being given into strong delusion to believe a lie therefore what the Bible says basically they're unable to accept Christ if they have not been before the church had been farted. But you think about the second part. We've been covering a little bit. They will be numbered as slaves for accountability. Revelation chapter 14 verses 9 through 11. Revelation 14, 9 through 11. And the third angel followed them saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the lamb and the smoke of their torment ascended up forever and ever. And they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here's what happened. Those that become a slave to this new leader. The Bible says that the indignation, the wrath of the indignation of God because they're choosing that person over God himself. The smoke of their torment is sent up forever and ever. There's no rest day or night. Those that mock at Christianity today and say, Ah, oh, I don't need that. I'm going to go have a party in hell and I'm going to rip it wide open. We're just going to have a great time. Boy, are they for in a rude awakening. I, I don't know about you, but every time I hear a man or a woman tell me that, I just have to cringe inside. They have no idea what they ask. I remember the third week I was on the fire department. We had a two-alarm fire of a two-story house. And one of the main guys, we call him entry 
uh, point entry guys was out. He didn't receive the call or didn't come to the call. So they needed a, a team of four, two guys each. And I was picked to go in. And I had been in a mock fire where they set a bunch of stuff on fire and sit around and practice breathing and whatever. But I'd never been in a fire that intense. And as we went through the door, I could not believe with all my Nomex, all of my protective gear, how hot I was. And it was just felt like my pants were actually melting on the inside of my Nomex. And the guy I was with was an associate pastor in Winder. And as we got out of the fire and we went through there, we were in the fire for at least 15 minutes checking door to door and trying to put it out from the inside to save the structure. It was the most intense heat I have ever felt in my life. And the worst was the flames all around you. You're literally covered in flames. And you're just turning a 360 with a hose and the fires everywhere from the ceiling lapping you around the, out of the doors. And all I could think about was hell. Man, can you imagine this? You would not have any Nomex. And being in that fire, we came out of the fire and we were talking about what a shame. And over the years that I was in the fire department, we had three fatalities that fell asleep and burnt to death. And as Mark and I would talk, Mark said, can you imagine being lost? Falling asleep on your couch and the cigarette drops, you die of carbon monoxide, and boom, you're burnt to death. You leave this world in flames, and you enter the next in flames. I, I can't imagine that. But as the Bible says, where the worm dieth not, the fire is not quenched, and the smoke of their torment ascended up day and night. Jennifer will agree, there's nothing you'll ever get out of your nose as burnt flesh. It is something you will never, ever forget. And this is something that every time I saw that, I thought, wow. Did he know? Did she know? But you never know. Time is short for everyone. But the Bible says here that those that are willingly following the Antichrist and his leadership, God's wrath will be against. But notice in Revelation 19 and verse 20. Revelation 19, 20, the final judgment of the Lord. And it says, And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before them, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image, these both were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. Notice how the caption says here, that deceive them. They're a great deceiver. They deceived all of those causes them to receive the mark of the beast here and here. He's smooth. Well, Guess who the leader of it all? The devil. He has been a practicing deception since the day one. He did it on Eve. He's done it. He even didn't try it on Christ. Now come worship me. He even convinced Peter because the Lord says, Satan, get thee behind me. You don't need to go to the cross. Let's fight it out. Whoa, wouldn't Satan love for God not to go to the cross? God's son go across. Thirdly, I want you to see, after the departure of the church, the world will believe a lie. Majority of the world, not all, majority of the world will be number of slaves for accountability. If you don't believe it, every prisoner of war camp had some type of numbering. The Japanese used little Leaflets, the, Isra um, the Germans use tattoos, the Russians use tattoos. The world system has used different ways to number their people. You think about what our world's capable of now. 
and how we can pay with our phone, we can drive by, we can tap with our cards. All convenience. But it's leading up to something more sinister. But thirdly, the rest of the world will suffer unimaginable hardship for rejection of God's salvation. And as the Bible says, and the wrath of Satan. What a double whammy. We have the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven vials. The seven seals in the Revelation 6, the Antichrist, the false prince of peace. We have war. We have famine. We have death and more death. We have this trumpets. You think about this. A third of the trees and grass destroyed. A third of sea life destroyed. A third of fresh water poison. A third of the moon and stars will be darkened. Then you have a fo- uh, first woe, locusts. Second woe, fire and brimstone. A third of the per- people left are killed. And then you have the earth and heaven shaken with earthquakes. Then you have 144,000 sealed where the devil himself can't touch it. And then you have the prophets raised back to life in front of all. Once again, when I was younger, I never could understand how they could see, where the whole world could see these two prophets raised back to life. Now I know. Instantaneous, Instagram, Facebook, everybody can see it. But you think about this. Christ's reign is foreseen. There's a silence in heaven. The vials bring boils. And then all sea life is destroyed. All water is poisoned. The sun is so scorching that people are burnt. There's a deep darkness. And through all of that, the Bible says, they raise their fists to heaven and curse God. Wow. Wouldn't you want to be calling for mercy? But no. The Bible says the river Euphrates dries up. And then the battle of Armageddon. There's a worldwide earthquake. And then Rome and Babylon are destroyed. And huge hailstones. And then the finality of it. God's second coming. Comes to set up his kingdom on earth for a thousand years. The devil and his angels and all the minions are bound. And there's peace. He is once again reigning in Jerusalem. What a day there is. And then for a short time the devil's released. And wouldn't you know it? He deceives men again. After living in a thousand years of peace and justice, men are deceived to rise up again and for the final battle against the Lamb. I just can't imagine having utopia and still rebelling. But after that, the Bible says there's the great white throne and then the new heaven and the new earth. It's amazing to see what is in the time to come. It's scary for those left behind. It's gratefulness on our parts when we say, thank you, Lord. We will not endure that wrath. But every one of us has friends and family, loved ones that just don't see the importance of Christ. And it breaks your heart. It breaks mine. But all we can do is pray and be a witness that God is important to us. Don't ever show them that God's a part-time God. Show them that He's good all the time. All the time, God is good. Because the saddest part about all of this is after all this torment for three and a half years of the latter part of the tribulation, Hell awaits them all. That is the hardest thing about 
all this to go through is those that reject Christ. Is basically saying, I don't want heaven, I want hell. And the Bible says here in Revelation 20, verse 11 through 15, And I saw the great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no peace for them, or place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books, plural, were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. There's a couple books. A book of works. Judging all the things they did on earth. But there's only one book. And it was the book of life. And when it was opened, when the Lord calls out to the angels or angel that was monitoring that book, or however it's done, is their name in that Lamb book of life? No, sir. It's not. The Bible says in Matthew 22, in the last days, he's going to say, depart from me, for I never knew thee. That is going to be the whole world will be there, including us. But this is not our judgment. We have the Bema seat. We'll be judged for the things we did in our body. Not judged on our sin. Not judged on our salvation. But judged on what we could have done and should have done and didn't do. The Bible says our works will be tried as fire. You ever hear the terminology, some of us going to get in by the skin of our teeth? We're saved, but it said everything we have is going to be burned up because our priorities weren't in the right place. Wouldn't it have been great if ever a Christian lived his life according to where when our works were tried by fire, they came forth as precious metal to lay at our Savior's feet? But I'm glad that God is merciful and new mercies are new every day. Until that trumpet sounds, we're God's messengers. Our job is that we could say, as Paul says, I am free from the blood of all men. The world needs to hear. They're not all going to accept. The Bible says that in Revelation 7, 9, that while the tribulation period will be a time of judgment, there will be a time of unprecedented redemption. Multitudes of people from the 144,000 will be saved. But the thing is, the Bible says as soon as they're saved, they're beheaded for his name. The devil is going to pour his wrath, the martyrs, the voice of the martyrs cry out to the Lord, How long, O Lord, how long? Avenge us. But I'm so glad that even through it all, God's mercy is still there to those that are in the four corners that may have never heard. Missionaries never got to. He gives ample plenty of time, especially in North America and Europe, for all of us to hear the gospel in the airwaves, in the internet, on anywhere you can look, you can get a copy of the Bible, you can see churches. If you are hungry and seeking, there's a way to find. But you know what the world's doing? We're good. We don't need God. That's an old folks' religion. That's, that's whatever. We've, we've got to get a job. We've got to get this. We've got to get that. We've got to get this. And, and then it's gone. 
How many of you heard, and I'm sure many of you heard it like I have, when I'm old and retired, then I'll serve the Lord. Or on my deathbed, then I'll get saved. What if you're in a car accident? There was no deathbed. What if you died of a heart attack? There was no deathbed. What if this? We don't know. That's why it says, boast not thyself of tomorrow. Because we don't know what tomorrow holds. That's what the rich man says. Tomorrow I'm going to tear down my barns and build bigger ones. Tomorrow the Lord says, thou fool, tonight thy soul will be required of thee. Don't boast in something we have no control over. Because heaven is certain, but so is hell. And a Christian's heart is that none should perish. That should all should come to saving grace. But unfortunately, this book proves it. Even Israel rejected the very Jesus Christ that did so many things for them. Crucify him, crucify him. Throughout the centuries, mankind has rejected the gospel ministry. The gospel message. The gospel messengers rejected him. I love what Hebrews chapter 11 says about the martyrs that have died for the faith of Christ, that the world was not worthy of them. Boy, what a statement from our Lord. They're, they're, they were too precious for this world. They didn't deserve them. How many missionaries have died over the years? How many Christians have died even in this great nation we have over the years? How many Christians have died in this world, in the Middle East today, are still persecuting Christians? In China, North Korea, other places. If you're a Christian, you're going to prison or executed. Simple as that. Yes, we don't hear about it. As often as we should be reminded that our brothers and sisters are being martyred around the world for the faith. Will it come here? I don't know. But are you ready if it does? Are you ready to stand for your faith and says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. I am not ashamed. The world thinks it's going to get rid of Christianity. One news anchor in the States said that we don't need God. Oh, yes, we do. They don't want to need God. But the world does need God. Christians, as we ponder the after-departure reality, once we leave, the world will be believing a lie. Majority of the world will be numbered and accountable. They will suffer unimaginable hardships. I can't imagine a day's wage for a loaf of bread. I can't imagine where the Bible says they're asking the mountains to fall upon them because they are so in pain. Boils. Can you imagine all your water poisoned in time? Scorching sun and desert. Darkness. Fire and brimstone. Earthquakes, wars. Man, it's just unimaginable. But I'm glad we're not there yet. Because there's still chance for souls to get saved. Amen. And this is our opportunity, Christians, now more than ever, to be a witness. Because we don't know what tomorrow holds. But we know who holds tomorrow. And while the Holy Spirit, the Bible says in Genesis chapter 6, that even God himself before the flood of man said, the Spirit of God will not always strive with man. He's not always going to be here. So let's be, as Hebrews says, let's not harden our hearts as in the day of provocation. Now is not the time to get calloused. Now is the time to get sensitive. 
and realize that we may be living in the last days. This may be the last moments. As we saw that short clip, we're not going to get an email that says, hey, be ready, I'm coming. The Bible says he's going to come as a thief in the night. And twinkling of an eye, we're gone. Are you ready this morning? If you're not, I want to implore you, beg you, plead with you. Now is not the time to put off salvation. If you don't know Jesus Christ, your personal Savior, Corinthians says today is the day of salvation. Being a church member, knowing God, reading your Bible, doing all that is great. But if your name is not found in the Lamb's book of life, you will not go when he comes against his church. No matter how religious we are, no matter how much we know God, if you don't know for sure that Jesus Christ is your Savior and you have confessed your sin, the Bible says, unless you repent, you will likewise perish. It's important. It is important, we know. The Bible says in 1 John 5, 13, these things are written that you may know. Not hope so salvation, might so, maybe, no. These things are written that you might know. And I hope you know this morning. If not, I want to encourage you to come see me, email me, message me or call me. And I want to take the word of God and show you how you can be saved today. If you know you're saved, and you know you're going to be in that number when the saints go home. Are you doing everything you can to be the messenger, ambassador during these last times? During these uncertain times, I should say. The world needs to hear. Needs something more than fear. They need hope. And that hope and joy is found in Jesus Christ. For he is our rock and our salvation. And our ever-present help in a time of trouble. Amen. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, Lord, I ask you that you would just lead God and direct in our days. As the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5, redeem the time for the days are evil. Help us to redeem every moment, every second of every day. To share the faith of Jesus Christ, of the transformation he did in our hearts. Lord, I thank you for what you've done and what you're going to do. Lord, if there's one online, there's one in the sanctuary that does not know Jesus Christ as a personal Savior and never made a personal calling and repenting of their sins, let this be the morning that they call. Lord, thank you for reminding us as Christians of the glorious days ahead, but the dark days ahead for the people that we know and love. And Lord, I ask you that you would just lead God and direct in our hearts that we would do our best to take every opportunity to witness and challenge people. Do you know my Savior? Thank you, Lord, for reminding us. Thank you, Lord, for challenging us. In that, we give you all honor and glory. Dismiss us with your blessing, O Lord. Lead God and direct in every day. Bring us back this evening at 6 as we continue to look at the great deceiver himself. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Thank you so much for being here this morning. May the Lord bless you. Looking forward to seeing each and every one of you online and here tonight at 6 o'clock. And uh, if you don't know Jesus Christ, your personal Savior, today is the day to know. Lord bless.